Hey everyone, how's it going? Thanks so much for tuning in. Today we are celebrating an incredible milestone because last Thursday, December 1st, 2016, my channel hit a million subscribers. That's a huge number and an incredibly humbling feeling to know that so many people visit this channel to find joy or to learn something or just to have fun. I cannot thank you guys enough for supporting what I love to do over all of these years and especially to you new subscribers. You know, I hope you enjoy the content. There's a lot of really cool stuff coming and I cannot wait to see what 2017 has in store. But you know, the whole time I've been on YouTube, I always tried to put up a special video when the channel hit a certain milestone. It used to be every 100,000 subscribers I'd put up like a supercar or something like that, but we've gotten so many incredible opportunities just in the last year alone, you know. The McLaren P1, the 918 Spider, the Bugatti Chiron, just the LaFerrari, I mean all of these crazy things. So I wanted to do something really special and more personal for this video. I'm going to review my first car. This is a 1995 Saab 900 SE convertible. My first car was a 97 model that I got in 2004, hence the channel name Saab Kylo 4. I bought this particular car earlier this year. A lot of you guys already know this because I've made a bunch of video content around it. Basically, I wanted to use this as a project car and to clone it to look identical to my first car. The only thing that I didn't do, this one has the you know optional 2.5 liter V6 while my car was a turbo. I'm not going to go swapping engines and stuff because I've already put more money into this car than anybody ever should put into a 21 year old Saab, but this project was an absolute labor of love. It didn't need a lot, just a bunch of maintenance stuff, some cosmetic things here and there, you know, of course buying some of the different parts and stuff to clone it to look like my first car, but you know, it turned out fantastic and I wouldn't trade any of that time, you know, for anything. I basically created a museum piece. I want to put this thing under like some spotlights and stuff and just just gaze at it. I've collected every piece of literature, brochure, you know, original road test article, press release, and everything that I could possibly find on this car. It's perfect. I love it. During this video, I'm going to talk about why I love it. Of course, we'll start it up, show the engine, get an exhaust clip, go over the performance data. I'll take it on a thorough drive and show you many of the unique aspects throughout the interior as well as exterior. So without further ado, let's go ahead and hop on in, start her up, and let her run. <coughs> Everyone remembers their first car and the feelings of independence and excitement that it brought. I have so many fond memories of my 97 Turbo as it was basically the car that I learned to drive on. It was different, luxurious, and unlike anything else my peers at high school had. Unfortunately, with rising maintenance, repair costs, and frequent trips to the shop, it became a little too much to bear so I ended up selling it after a year or so of ownership. Since then, leading up to this point in my life, I've owned many cars, all very diverse from one another. But one thing that's always resided in the back of my mind was what if I was actually able to track down and rebuy my first car as I never really had the chance to develop a bond with it. While finding my original car proved to be a lost cause, I saw this one for sale online and immediately jumped on it. These cars don't come up for sale that often and it's really hard to find one that's been well kept both cosmetically and mechanically. Keeping that in mind, you can imagine how hard of a task it was to try to find all of that plus one that had the same spec as my car was. I didn't even care that it didn't have the turbo. This was my first car all over again. At this point, I cannot see ever getting rid of it. The memories and excitement that I felt during this project are irreplaceable. The second generation Saab 900, also known as the new generation or NG 900, was first introduced in sedan form for 1994, followed soon after by the coupe and convertible models in 1995. 
Built on top of General Motors' GM2900 platform, the NG900 was a clean sheet design from top to bottom, featuring fresh styling, three all-new engine options, and a very well-appointed interior. The Classic 900 was and always will be an icon. It's an unforgettable part of Saab's history. Even though the NG900 was different in many ways, it was still very much a Saab, although perhaps a little less quirky. It made great strides over its predecessors with improvements in quality, refinement, and general road manners, especially with the convertibles, which featured an entirely new soft top design. Saab had been making convertible 900s since 1986, and while nearly 50,000 of those found homes between then and 1994, there was a lot of room to improve. The NG900 was a culmination of those improvements that led to the creation of a proper four-season convertible that could sit four passengers comfortably. Unlike the previous offering, the NG900's design was completely original from the A-pillars back. The front end and lower door assemblies were shared with the coupe, but that's pretty much it. Even the suspension received special tuning. The NG900's body is far more streamlined and aerodynamic than the classic 900, which traced its roots back to the late 1970s. To me, the NG900 has aged very well over the years, especially when you see one as clean as this. The body structure benefited from a 73% improvement in torsional stiffness and a weight reduction of 27 pounds, despite additional chassis reinforcements. In fact, Saab claimed the new convertible could withstand almost 30% more crush load than its predecessor. The big news with the redesigned soft top is that it now had its own dedicated storage bin within the trunk. This greatly improved the general aesthetics of the car, as the top can now be hidden underneath a smooth tonneau cover. Before, when you lowered the top, it would collapse behind the rear seat and sit exposed. Although Saab did include a cover, it had to be manually affixed. To lower the top, all you have to do is unlatch two handles on the windshield header and press back on a switch in the center console. The rear portion of the top raises up for proper clearance when the power tunnel cover begins to rise. Then everything progressively folds down neatly into the dedicated soft boot. Once done, the tonneau cover closes and you have a smooth, clean surface that is not only pleasing to the eye, but is partially wrapped in pedal material. Unlike many convertible tops nowadays, which can operate when driving at low speeds, the 900's top can only be operated when sitting stationary. Also, by having a glass rear window instead of a conventional plastic rear window, Saab was able to integrate a rear defroster, something that neither the Audi Cabriolet or the BMW 325i convertible offered at the time. In 1995, this 900 SE convertible came with an MSRP of $38,450, including a $460 destination charge. With the optional V6 engine and automatic transmission, this brought the grand total to $39,845. In contrast, the entry model 900S convertible would have been in the low $30,000 range. Saab offered three different wheel packages for the 900 in 1995. On the 900S, 15x6 inch steel wheels were standard, featuring full wheel covers and 195-60 all-season tires. The 900SE maintained the same dimensions and tires, but upgraded to turbine spoke alloy wheels. The 900 Turbo is equipped with Saab's signature 16x6.5 inch Viking Shield alloys and 205-50 tires. They gave the car a great stance and an added touch of sport. Being that my first car was a turbo, I swapped out the turbine spoke wheels for a set of Viking wheels that I was fortunate enough to find online. While the style certainly isn't for everyone, I couldn't imagine having a 900 without them. The brakes consist of 11.2 inch internally ventilated discs up front with single piston calipers and 10.2 inch solid discs in the rear also with single piston calipers. Together with 3-channel ABS and standard traction control, they are able to stop the car from 60 miles an hour in about 160 feet with good control and excellent pedal feel. Brake and performance remains pretty consistent too, even after a few laps around a closed circuit. The power-assisted rack and pinion steering is on the heavy side, but it feels great, offering lots of feedback. It has an overall ratio of 16.6 to 1, and it takes 3.7 turns to lock. The turning circle is measured at 35.4 feet. The 900's front suspension is composed of independent McPherson struts and forged aluminum double wishbones, while the rear features a semi-rigid twist-beam axle with trailing arms. 
Coil springs and tube shocks can be found at each corner, along with front and rear anti-roll bars. Compared to other 900s, the convertible features heavy-duty front shocks and stiffer anti-roll bars. The ride quality is not only smooth, but the car feels solid and substantial. It's the type of ride you'd expect from a premium convertible that puts a high priority on comfort by filtering out unwanted bumps and vibrations. Despite this, it still handles itself pretty well and is capable of holding up to 0.77g of lateral acceleration. Only when pushed hard, harder than most would ever do on a public road, is there any noticeable understeer tendency. At 3,239 pounds, the 900 SE convertible was between 150 and 250 pounds lighter than competitors from Audi and BMW. With the second generation 900, you had a choice between three engines. Not only was this the first 900 to use transversely mounted engines, but it was also the first to offer a V6. The 900S was powered by a naturally aspirated 2.3 liter 4 cylinder that made 150 horsepower and 155 pound feet of torque. SE models came standard with a 2 liter turbocharged 4 cylinder that made an impressive 185 horsepower and 195 pound feet of torque. The 2.5 liter V6 was borrowed from GM and was only available for the SE. It came at a $500 premium. Developing 170 horsepower at 5,900 RPM and 167 pound-feet of torque at 4,200 RPM, the V6 can accelerate to 60 miles an hour in about 8.6 seconds and hit a top speed of 132 miles per hour. It's constructed using an iron block with aluminum heads, dual overhead camshafts, and four valves per cylinder. The compression ratio is rated at 10.8 to 1 and maximum engine speed is 6,000 RPM. While Saab enthusiasts may lament the option of a V6, both competitors from Audi and BMW at the time did offer similar size six cylinders, so at least it was competitive in that respect. While Saab's V6 wasn't the most powerful, thanks to a weight advantage it proved to be the quickest according to a comparison test performed by Car and Driver back in 1994. I will say, aside from the typical maintenance bills expected for a 21-year-old car, the V6 has performed admirably in the 5,000 plus miles I've driven it so far. The only downside to the V6 is a defect with the timing belt tensioner which, if memory serves me correct, requires a belt change every 30,000 miles or so. Other than that, they seem like pretty sound motors if taken care of properly. As far as transmissions, two were available for the four-cylinder models, including a standard five-speed manual or a four-speed electronically controlled automatic. If you opted for the V6, the automatic was your only choice. However, the automatic did come with three driving modes, including normal, sport, and winter. When sport mode is selected, the shift points are raised so you can better utilize the engine's power when driving spiritedly. It's a big difference from normal mode, which ups shifts a little too early for my taste. Not only does it make the car peppier around town, but it also makes it much more responsive to kickdowns. Winter mode will start the car off in third gear to better avoid spinning the tires in slippery conditions. The 900 carries an 18 gallon tank and with the V6 runs on regular and leaded. EPA fuel economy estimates for 1995 ranged between 19 miles per gallon in the city and 27 miles per gallon on the highway. Typical average in normal driving is around 23 miles per gallon. So now let's go ahead and see if she sounds, both sitting still and on the road.
I've always considered the interior of the second generation 900 to be one of its best attributes. Saab departed quite a bit from the design seen in prior 900s by modernizing and significantly increasing overall quality. Thanks to a generous use of higher end materials and a wealth of new technology, Saab created an environment that not only looked and felt more premium, but one that truly had what it took to take on the German competition. Plus, being a Saab, a high priority was placed on functionality, simplicity, and of course, safety. The primary differences between a 900S and 900SE is the level of standard equipment. Heated seats and heated mirrors are standard on all 900s, and the majority of interior surfaces are also finished in soft padding. All 900 convertibles, including the S and SE, came standard with leather upholstery. A genuine California burl walnut dash treatment was available as an option. It adds a nice touch of warmth to the interior, especially this one being all black. I swapped out this car's original black plastic dash piece for the wood one to match how my first car was equipped. The SE also came with full power adjustments for both front seats, along with three-person memory for the driver. In 1996, Saab added manual lumbar adjustment to the driver's seat to reduce fatigue and improve long-term comfort. Generally speaking, the seats are still comfortable even without the lumbar. It would be nice to have, but I wouldn't consider it a deal breaker. The padding is on the firm side and the lateral support keeps you in place. The headrests are adjustable vertically and the steering wheel is adjustable only for reach. All of the controls are logically placed, easily readable, and nothing is more than a short reach away. The majority of power accessories can be found across the center console, including the automatic windows, a button that raises and lowers all four windows at once, and the toggle to control the convertible top. This leaves the doors clean and free from clutter. I especially like how the left side of the dash gently curves around the driver. With regards to storage, there's pockets across the doors and a generous locking glove box. Along with being illuminated, there's even two shallow drink coasters. Across the center console, there's no storage aside from a small tray just ahead of the shifter. However, at the rear, you'll find a couple of additional cup holders and a spot to store spare change. In addition to high strength steel reinforcements within the body structure, both the driver and passenger receive airbags. Lastly, compared to its predecessor, the new convertible top features 40% larger rear quarter windows for improved rearward visibility. An 8-speaker 160-watt audio system came standard along with an in-dash tape player and a 6-disc CD changer located in the trunk. All of the buttons are large and easy to see, it's very, very simple to use. In the middle are your bass, treble, balance, and fade knobs. You push them, they come out, you twist them left and right to make your adjustments. In the very middle is a button called loud, you just push that once, and basically that amplifies the sound even more. What's also pretty cool is this radio is capable of receiving weather band frequencies for continuous weather and emergency updates. Weather outlook for Central North Carolina. For today and tonight, hazardous weather is not expected at this time. Now the extended outlook for the Tuesday through Sunday. Right above the radio, all 900s have an analog clock as well as a digital display that not only houses your radio information and outside temperature, but a very comprehensive driver's information system. The SE also came standard with electronic automatic climate control. Hands down, my favorite feature in this car is the black panel, which disables the digital displays and the instruments surrounding the speedometer. So at night, you can turn everything off and just focus on the speedometer going down the road. It's a really, really cool feature. Because these seats are powered to gain access to the back seat, you would lift up on that little handle to tip the backrest forward, then use the sliding adjustments to make the entire assembly go forward. The back seat is a lot roomier than you would expect. It's made to fit adults no problem. I'm 5 foot 10 and I still have plenty of room to spare. There's adjustable air vents back there to keep things comfortable, padded material across the doors, storage pockets on the back of the seats, adjustable reading lamps, and tons of padding. Not only are the rear headrests adjustable, but you have good lower back support, decent lateral support. It's just a really, really nice environment to be in. You can open up the trunk three different ways. There's a button on the driver's door, a lock cylinder on the trunk lid itself, as well as a button on the remote fob. Compared to its predecessor, the second generation 900 convertible boasts more total cargo space. 
Now with the top down, there's a partition that's required to be put down, that's the soft boot that I showed you earlier. But when the top is up and in place, you can actually pull that boot out of the way to increase total cargo space to 12 cubic feet. Again, to operate the top, you have to lower that soft boot, and even with the soft boot down, you still have about 10 cubic feet. The previous 900 convertible had 10.7 in total. By giving the back seat the ability to fold down, extra flexibility was added as well, especially for longer items or larger items. Like I said, there's a trunk mounted CD player, but there's also illumination for low light working. Underneath the trunk floor is a temporary spare tire with your changing equipment and a tool kit. Well everyone, I hope you enjoyed the in-depth look at my first car. Be sure to stay tuned next time. Don't forget to leave a like and subscribe today. There's always a lot more where that came from. Take care everyone. Mm -hmm.